<laughs> For real. <laughs> All right. Uh, can y'all hear me? You good? Okay. Um, before I start, I would like to dedicate this speech to Amber Evans and Marshawn McCarroll, two people that spent their lives supporting people that dealt with pain. So what's interesting about pain is I consider it to be one of the few or maybe only universal experiences. When I was in college, I had a philosophy professor tell me that among philosophers, philosophers it's a debate that the sun is actually the only universal experience. And to that, I would say no, because I'm positive that your white next door neighbor that deals with chronic illness can tell you what pain is. Your black coworker that drives home from work and is pulled over by the police and is traumatized can tell you what pain is. Your friend from another, another country that has been called every single name except for the name they were given at birth can tell you what pain is. The woman that has to deal with laws telling her what to do and what not to do with her body can tell you what pain is. The child that identifies as queer and is afraid to open up and tell their parents who they are because of the fear of rejection can tell you what pain is. I can guarantee you, now that I'm saying these things, no one's thinking about the sun. <laughs> See, pain is universal. Let me tell you about some of my pains. Um, when I was younger, bags of chips used to cost 25 cents. Y'all too young to even know how that existed. Now, they cost 25,000 cents. That's painful. <laughs> um, Sunday is painful to me because Sunday, we spend all of Sunday preparing for Monday. A whole day is gone. Sunday is painful for me. Um, being a burden to someone. Looking at someone you care for and asking yourself if you should be a part of this person's life because you feel like you may be holding them back. That is a painful experience to sit on. One of the most painful experiences for me was trying to figure out my purpose in life. When you are attempting to figure out your purpose in life as a young person, it can be hurtful and confusing. You're thinking, how can I contribute to the world how can I change something? How can I support people? How can I find some type of meaning? And if you don't know what it is and you're looking around, you see all your friends and your family figuring out what it is they want to do, that messes with your self-esteem. And it is hard to figure out who you are as an individual. I thought to myself, well, Dante, you know, you've been through some things as a teenager. You made it through all right. You've been through some mental health issues. The least I could do is be of support to a young person that may need someone to talk to. If there is anything that I could do that is bare minimum, that is enough. So I set out to be that person, not knowing when, where, who this was going to happen with or when it was going to ignite. But that was the, the decision I made. And that is what I wanted to do. Through college, I ended up volunteering at a church um, not too far from here, about 10 minutes away called First English Lutheran Church uh, on Main and 22nd, close to downtown. And I used to work with the elementary level kids, but every now and then teenagers would come through. And they wouldn't stay too long, so we didn't really pay it too much attention, right? So one day, a younger kid and a teenager gets into a slight altercation with each other. And as I come around the room to see what's going on, now the pastor's husband and the teen are going back and forth with each other arguing. And this transitions outside, and now the pastor and the teenage boy's older brother are arguing with each other. I don't know what came over me, but I threw myself in the middle of all of it. <laughs> and I told the pastor, Pastor Sally, I need you to go back inside of the church. If they see you are upset and you are responding, they are gonna have a response. She went back inside of the church. I told the teenage boy's older brother, I need you to trust me and know that I will not allow anything to happen to your younger brother. I need you to go home. He went home. The police pulls up. I tell the police, please do not do 
anything until I have the chance to talk to this young man. I don't want anything bad to happen to him. So I go over to the young man, I grab him and we start walking home. And I tell him, I want you to come to the church, but altercations like that cannot happen. And he's shaking his head like he understands. And before I know it, I'm sitting on the porch with him, his brother, his mom, his dad, his sister. We're laughing and joking and sharing stories. And it starts to become dark. I'm like, damn, I've been here for a while. And as I was leaving, I'm like, I don't even know this kid's name. So I asked him, what's your name, man? And uh, hold on. There we go. He said, my name is TJ. That is when I met TJ, and, is, and that is the moment where I felt I could apply the vision and idea that I had to be someone for someone. This is the kid that brings my idea to life. Now I can put it into motion and I can actually do something that matters. So I ended up creating a teens group at the church. Uh, TJ came and his older brother came. A lot of young men in the neighborhood came. There was a man, a young man that came that was a little bit older than the rest of them, but we didn't pay it too much attention because he was a part of the neighborhood. He also went through a lot of things that they went through and figured out how to survive the circumstances that they all were living in. So one week he didn't show up and we didn't think anything of it because it was normal for kids to not come every single week. So another week passes and another week passes. And we're all asking if we've seen that young man. And as we're asking where he's been, no one knows. I go home, I cut the news on to see his name go across the screen for the news person to say that he was murdered. When I found out he was murdered, I quit the group. What BS can I tell a group of young boys that have to look at their peer that they looked up to that gave them life and significance when I'm not even around. There is nothing I can say or do that can change the mind, the heart, the feeling, and the harsh reality that these boys are dealing with. It's a joke for me to show up and say anything. So I quit and I did not feel bad about it because I didn't feel like I was worthy of being there with them. I don't know what it was, but something told me that I have to come back to the group. I came back. Yes, I still felt like a failure, but I also realized that I cannot abandon the boys. That's what I felt happened to me. I cannot repeat that experience. So, and I also thought TJ is still here. So with this experience of losing this young man, what I know now, is that I cannot wait until someone dies or something bad happens to show a person that I care about them. So time passes and I have moments to connect with TJ more. Um, he ends up getting a job at my job. It, it was normal for teens to come and work with us over the summer, but I had absolutely nothing to do with him getting a job at my job. I was so excited. And I told all of my coworkers, I told everyone, this is the kid that changed my life. If I'm not here, please look after him, talk to him. And my reason for doing that is because I wanted him to know that I learned my lesson, that we care about you just because you are. You don't have to do anything major. We just want you to know that you are loved and we don't want anything bad to happen to you to feel like that is when you matter. So, I had opportunities to engage with TJ on that level, but there were also moments where I didn't get to engage with TJ on that level. And sometimes just with people in general, because something that I deal with is deep depressive episodes. And when I'm in those deep depressive episodes, I don't like humans. Am I the only one? Okay, I didn't think so. So last year, uh, November, November, I'm at an event with my friend and I'm feeling those feelings inside of me starting to fester where I start to isolate when I'm quiet and I don't talk too much. Um, and she said, you know, Dante, I wanna go on a trip with my family 
but I may not be able to go because it's during Christmas and we need someone to watch our animals. And I'm thinking to myself, well, I hate humans, but I love animals. <laughs> I think I'm your guy. So she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, you know, yes. And she's like, it's Christmas time. And I'm like, well, sin accounts as a human and I don't like him either. <laughs> yes, I am your guy. So I'm at her house and I'm sitting with the dogs enjoying myself about three days in. And she gives me a call. And she's like, Dante, we're having issues with the flight. All of our baggage is missing. Nothing is going right. We are on our way back home. This vacation has been cut short. And I'm like, damn, I got to go back to the humans. Damn. <laughs> um, and I, I just get on social media, scrolling like any other day. And I see TJ's great uncle on there. And I just check on his page and see what's going on. I go to his page. I see a picture of TJ. I see the date he was born. And I see a date behind the day he was born. I start to go to other people's pages to clarify what I'm thinking is true and make sure that I'm correct. Because when you see another date after your birthday, that means that you have passed away. So as I'm checking, I'm seeing people saying, rest in peace, TJ, rest in peace, TJ. That shattered my soul. And at that moment, I realized that TJ, uh oh, hold up. Where that blank screen at? Hold on. Oh, we go up. My bad. Let me say that over like I didn't say it. Y'all ready? In that moment, I realized that I had lost TJ. Blank screen. Um, so I make my way to the funeral. And when I get to the funeral, what's interesting is my first thought is, Dante, even though you're sad, even though you're hurting, even though you want to cry, you need to hold this stuff in because it's unfair for you to show any emotions when his parents and his friends are probably going through so much more than you. So as I'm sitting there looking at TJ inside of a casket, I'm crying on the inside, but I'm not really showing anything on the outside. And then this man comes up to me and he puts his hand on my shoulder. It was TJ's dad. And he says to me, Dante, you know you were like a second father to him. And when he said that, he put a lot in perspective for me because I questioned, why am I so, so bothered by the loss of TJ? I've lost plenty of people before. I've even lost other children before, but it's something about TJ that is hurting more than usual. When he said that I was like a second father to him, I realized that I always told people he was like a little brother, but his father put it in perspective that this was like me losing a child. And the second thing, if I was like his father, what type of father has no idea that his son is not alive. That hurt. And in that moment, I vanished. I stayed to myself, didn't speak to anyone for a while. And what was interesting was in this moment, everyone done exactly what I didn't want them to do. And it's not because I don't like them. It's because I wasn't ready. Everyone started to check in on me. Um, for instance, this is my friend Jahari, and she's asking, Dante, how have you been? I, you haven't said anything on social media. I know her as a person that I work with in the school, not as this person that is in pain and she has to check on me. This is my friend Paula. Me and her wrote books at the same exact time. We always talk about books. We don't talk about my pain. This is, so you know that friend that don't take nothing serious. <laughs> My friend, that's a graphic designer, asks, he puts me on a milk box. 
I ain't gonna lie, when I saw it, I laughed, but I went back to being depressed. But he knows me as someone that he jokes with, not as somebody that's in pain. Melissa, she has a group for mothers that have lost their children, and I document their different experiences and events. She knows me as a person, documents their pain, not me talking about my pain. This is my friend Deborah that works at Ohio State. She knows me as an educator. She invited me to talk to her students, not to talk to me about my pain. Candy, she drove from a different side of Ohio and met me for an event that I did, and she's been supporting me for 10 years. That's how she knows me, not through my pain. This is my friend Ashley. Her mother, Margaret, was one of my biggest supporters, and I only met her one time. The last thing Ashley needs to worry about is me dealing with my pain and dismissing the pain that she's feeling of missing her mother. This is Amanda, one of the first facilitation gigs that I had with the city. She came, we exchanged information. That's how we're supposed to know each other, not me talking about my pain. This is Lori. I don't even remember how we met, but she always had my back. We ain't never talked about my pain. I don't want to talk about my pain. This is Michelle. She's one of the mothers, a part of Melissa's group. She is shy and reserved. She don't like talking to people. She don't like cameras. But she found a way to check in on me to make sure I was OK. And that hurt because I know the pain she's going through. I don't want to share mine. This is my friend, Badri. She knows me through business. She says, I am really worried about Dante Wood Spikes. Has anyone spoken to him recently? I just want to make sure he's OK. So I was gone for a while, and I did not talk to anyone at all, period. You, you remember. <laughs> you checked on me. I remember. So uh, after two months, I checked in with everybody, said two months feel like two days during grief. Thank you for all the love and support. At this moment, I was starting to come out of my shell, starting to feel a little bit better, but I was still in a space where I was hurting. And I thought, I have to do something with my body because if I continue to sit, I don't know what I'm going to do to my body. So I started to go to the park and work out. And as I'm sitting there working out, I'm reflecting on my life because a major part of my identity was working with children. Now that the child that gave me the purpose of living and working with children is gone, I don't want to do this anymore, but I don't know what else I have to do. So while I'm thinking that, I kept being disrupted every time I was working out, trying to figure out what it is I want to do. But I kept getting distracted over and over and over and over. Can anybody guess what it was that kept distracting me? Them damn kids. <laughs> <laughs> they was, look, he got a diaper on. And he put, put himself up. But when I was working out, the kids would just come over and start working out with me, emulating my behavior and the things that I was doing. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't like myself right now. I don't know why you're here. You need to get away from me, little kid. But they didn't. And seeing them made me think to myself, as much as I have chosen to work with children, children are also given the opportunity to decide if they want to work with you. It is a two-way street. And when I had that epiphany, that's when the healing for me started to really begin. So I thought last year I didn't talk to anyone at all. This year, around the same time, I thought, what if I checked in with the people that checked in on me and they had a chance to talk about pain with me today? So on social media, I asked a couple of questions. Um, and here are some of the reflections that people in Columbus have shared with me. One of my friends said when she feels pain, she thinks about divorce. My friend Lori, the deaths of my parents. My friend Carissa, my mother passing away when I was just a young woman. My friend Simon, in the last few years, I've lost a number of close friends from childhood, my dad and his brother, just days apart. Stevie, when my kids were under two years old, my youngest child was hurt in my home and I was threatened with my children being removed from my custody. Patia, that time I got pregnant by the pastor and the church vilified me even though he was a groomer. Paula, 
loss of my father and taking him off of life support. Danielle, losing my mother. She's very much still alive, but I didn't realize until my adult years recently that she has been emotionally abusive to me. When I listen to all of those responses, pain is not something that we ask for, but when it's there, we recognize that it exists and we feel it. Pain is like a, a warning, reminding your body that you feel something and that there is a response that exists. None of us are asking for it, but we acknowledge that it is there. Another question that I had asked to my friends was what happens when we compare our pain? So after asking my friends that I thought, there's a group of young people that come to Creative Mornings all the time. And I was wondering, what are young people thinking when it comes to painful experiences? And they're, they're all kind of sitting in the front row right here. But um, we had a short conversation for the sake of time. I can't show the whole thing. But here's a short clip of the conversations that we had when we discussed the concept of pain with each other. Society makes it out so that certain losses are harder, more painful than other ones. The reason we can bear pain is like, in America, we're a very, we're so up like a bootstrap society. I think it definitely depends on like, the environment you were raised up in. Every time I would try to open up about how I felt, if I can't feel as bad as I am because it's not that bad. Like We're all in different paths of life. We're all going through different things mentally, physically. And I was in practice one day and I felt something snap in the back of my knee. I didn't articulate how bad it was because I already knew at that age that I shouldn't be talking about that. Like even in this conversation, I was like, Ooh, should I even go? Because like my stuff isn't as like, you know, difficult. A month and a half ago, I saw like my father really like break down um, over an event that occurred in our house. Whenever I say something that matters or that like feels important to me, it's just like invalidated or it's like, I've always needed a little bit of validation. Just I've always been too scared to talk about my emotions. When we try to validate each other's pain, try to like put like all your pains less. That's just us being like selfish. My parents have always been divorced. When they got divorced, it cost a lot of money. Uh, when I was about seven, my dad passed away from uh, heart problems. I'd never had like a father figure or like a male figure in my life. And I feel like we belittle it or compare it. And I think bringing it all to, like bringing us all together as community and having these conversations and talking about it is what humans are built to do and meant to do. Well, eighth grade, I had a friend group that I was with all up until eighth grade. And, and as soon as I started trying to be me more, um, my friends, they completely cut me off. Everyone does experience pain differently and emotions are very complicated, but they all go on in here and we can't read each other's minds. Pain is something that's not new. It happens when we're young. Sometimes we rediscover it once we become older. If we ask our young people, they have experiences and ways to express the pain that they're feeling too. When we heal pain, I asked my friends this question and some of the responses I've had was share the story. You are only as sick as your secrets. Paula, time, allowing myself to experience the pain with the goal of achieving some sense of a bearable level. Ara, I need time alone, preferably nature. I need time with God, quiet, rest. A period of time where no one needs anything from me. Caressa, surrounding myself with folks who are committed to their own healing and to facilitating that healing process in others. Danielle, boundaries. <laughs> lots and lots of boundaries. Pam, Quiet, a long time for me, preferably among trees, not sure if it's meditation or reflective thinking. Pain is something that we all have access to. It is not special to one person, but it is unique how we experience it and how it exists inside of our bodies and how we feel it. It is not a competition to find out who can heal the fastest or who is hurting the most. It's an opportunity to get in tune with who you are, what it is you're feeling, and understanding your own personal unique response. 
And I know that some of you have New Year's resolutions. So I'm going to tell you what your New Year's resolution is. <laughs> your New Year's resolution is even though you will feel pain in the upcoming years, you will make a little bit of space for yourself to give yourself grace and understanding that it is a process and it isn't something that you figure out immediately. Your pain is yours. You can do as you see fit with it. And remember that it is a reminder that you have the ability to feel something. When you become numb, that's when it's scary. If you still have the ability to feel any sense of pain, you have an idea that you have the ability to feel. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.